welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Let us gather as a people of courage, trusting Christ's Spirit to quiet the storms engulfing our lives and restore peace in the chaos lapping against us. The ringing of the Trinity invites us to move from getting there to being here. The prayer of the day is provided for your use in becoming more attentive to God's Spirit present in our midst. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is near. In his presence, unbridled powers are controlled and beleaguered people are rescued. Let us come aside and worship this living force as we join in the call to worship printed in the bulletin. God alone laid the foundations of the earth. The morning stars sang together, and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. From the midst of the whirlwind, God speaks with power. We have seen the deeds of the Lord, who commands and raises the stormy wind, and also makes the storm be still. We ourselves have seen the wondrous deeds of the Lord. Let us worship God.
in the midst of the storm, Christ's Spirit gently bears us up and rescues us from all our foes. Let us turn our attention in a different direction as we join in the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. Saving God, we confess that our faith is too small, our fear is too great. When we are overwhelmed, we think you do not care enough for us. When life is uncertain and risky, we are not sure we can trust you with our whole hearts. Even when you move among us in powerful ways, we question who you are. Forgive us and calm our fears, we pray. Teach us to trust in your presence to save and guide us in every circumstance. Grant us your peace, which is clearly beyond our understanding. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us now join in a time of silent confession. Let us pray. Amen. When we are still and trust the Lord to order and provide, we discover a holy love holding us. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Know that you are safely in God's fold and be at peace. Amen. Let us remember Jesus' way to live in this ever-present love as we say together our Lord's summary of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. As we prepare now to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we know that our own words lack knowledge whenever we try to speak of you or to you, and yet we are drawn into your presence and desire to understand all your mysteries. So now, by the gift of your Holy Spirit, speak your words and we will listen carefully, responding in awe and gratitude. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. In the fall, in the midst of the pandemic, in one of our adult Sunday school classes, we, we studied theology using Shirley Guthrie's book, Christian Doctrine, which is a pretty dry title for a, an engaging and accessible book. So one of the things that has stuck with me from that class is this idea that Guthrie comes back to um, as he weaves together a comprehensive view of theology. He says, 
that good theology and our study of it should lead us to ask better questions, should lead us to ask better questions. So for example, we might struggle with the question, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people like us, like me? Why has God allowed me to experience this loss, this pain? And to those questions, we might never find answers that will satisfy that need that we have for certainty. But perhaps we can ask different questions, better questions. We might, we might notice from our own experiences in life and in reading of the Bible that suffering happens even to the most faithful of people. So maybe a better question would be, where is God in the midst of this suffering, in the midst of my suffering? And then the answer might not come from intellectual inquiry, from, from study and gaining knowledge, but from experience, from our reading of the Bible, stories in the Bible of people who, who almost drowned in the midst of a violent storm, or of people who, who had lost everything and now scream their anger at God, and witnessing how God shows up in these stories for these people. Or perhaps the answer would come from our own experience of calm heading into a serious surgery, or suddenly find ourselves, finding ourselves flooded with love for the world even as we are anxious for the things that are happening around us. Or the experience, maybe you've known this, after long and agonizing days of prayer, the answer, the answer to prayer suddenly arrives in our minds or in our lives, and it feels like grace and a gift from God. Good theology, meaning good language and study and experience of God, help us to ask better questions we have two readings this morning, one from the Old Testament, one from the New, and they, they are connected, they are related. In both, there are people who are feeling abandoned by God. The disciples wonder if God is going to sleep through the storm they are experiencing. And Job wonders where God is as he suffers loss that he does not deserve. Is God just? Is God just or is the universe only chaos? And the thing that struck struck me in sitting with these stories this week are the questions, the questions that are asked. So, so listen now for the questions. Hear now God's word to us. The first comes from the gospel according to Mark. This is from chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Later that day, when evening came, Jesus said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. They left the crowd and took him in the boat just as he was. Other boats were following along. Gale force winds arose and waves crashed against the boat so that the boat was swamped. But Jesus was in the rear of the boat, sleeping on a pillow. They woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we are drowning? And he got up and gave orders to the wind and said to the lake, silence, be still. And the wind settled down and there was a great calm. And Jesus asked them, why are you frightened? Don't you have faith yet? Overcome with awe, they said to each other, who is this then? Even the wind and the sea obey him. And from Job, this is chapter 38, verses one through 11. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this darkening counsel with words lacking knowledge? Prepare yourself like a man. I will interrogate you and you will respond to me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you know. Who set its measurements? Surely you know. Who, who stretched a measuring tape on it? 
on what were its footings sunk, who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sung in unison and all the divine beings shouted, who enclosed the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and a dense cloud its wrapped, when I imposed my limit for it, put on a bar and doors and said, you may come this far, no farther. Here, your proud waves stop. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Both of these stories are full of questions. Jesus, do you not care that we are drowning? People of faith, why are you afraid? Where is your faith? Who is this person who can control the wild wind and sea? Who is this human who is darkening God's counsel with words that lack knowledge? Where were you when the world was created? Can you hold back the sea? So some of these questions are questions that we might ask, and some of them are questions asked of us. So we're going to leave the disciples and Jesus in the boat in the storm and focus our attention on Job. Job, who lived out his faith perfectly and was seemingly rewarded for it with wealth and land and many children and good health. In the beginning of the story, God points out the faithfulness of Job and the accuser, the Satan, wonders what Job's faith is really like, since it has never really been tested. Underneath this whole scene lurks this this big question, and it is a good one. Why do we love God? Why do we love God? Do we love God because God gives us the things that we want and need? Do we love God because life is good and we feel like God is keeping us safe and giving us good things? Do we love God because God answers our prayers in ways that are satisfying to us? On what terms do we love God? Is God to be loved for God's own sake or because of what we think God does for us? And then what happens when the good things fall away? When pain and illness, the loss of independence, the loss of a loved one comes, when our kids are not all right, when there is job loss, home loss, financial uncertainty, when there is a global pandemic, do we still love God then? It turns out that Job does still love God, even when everything is stripped away from him, enough love to rail at God and question God and demand answers. Job cries out one of the most heartbreaking cries in the Bible, cursing the day he was born, crying out for the undoing of God's creation in Genesis, a return to a time of darkness and chaos and no light. He cries, let the day perish in which I was born. Let that day be darkness. May God above not see it, nor light shine on it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let the clouds settle upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none. Job wonders if God can be good and just, given what has happened to him. So the prevailing wisdom of Job's day stated that the the world's construction was the result of careful planning by God. Good things came to good people. Bad things happened to bad people. And Job looked around and concluded, to the contrary, that an unjust and an irrational world disproved any wisdom or careful planning on the part of God. In this world, the wicked succeed and the innocent suffer. Job says, the dying groan and the throat of the wounded cries for help, yet God pays no attention to their prayer. 
And Job counted himself among those whom God had not heard. Is the universe good and just, or is it chaotic and meaningless? And if it is chaotic and meaningless, what does that say about God the Creator? And perhaps deep down, beneath all those questions, is is the deeper question, God, where are you? Are you still there? Are you listening? The text we read from the book of Job is God's answer to Job's laments and Job's demand to put God on trial. Job states, if I summon God to court and he answered me, I do not believe he would listen to my voice. Surely he would crush me with a whirlwind and multiply my wounds without cause. Well, God does indeed show up in a whirlwind. And his first response to Job addresses creation, but in such a way that that changes the entire framing of the conversation. So now there are scholars who read God's answers to Job and interpret God as being a bully. And you might hear it that way. When I read it, I think of God as trying to, to reset Job's perspective, maybe with a touch of snark. Job, you seem to think that you know everything. Let's fix that. Prepare yourself. Gird up your loins, in some translations. Gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you some questions about the mysteries of the universe. Can you tell me how the world was designed and formed? Can you tell me how the chaos of the waters and the winds are held in check? God says, that God laid the foundations of the world like an architect, carefully measuring. And when the cornerstones were put in place, the heavenly choirs filled the air with celebration. And then God says something remarkable. God also gives birth to the chaotic power of the sea and wraps it in clouds like a swaddling blanket and sets up a playpen with bars and a door to keep its wild, creative energy contained. God is saying that the world is carefully and divinely created, but within it, there are chaotic elements contained by God. It is this power over the chaos of the sea that the disciples are so astonished by as the the waves and the wind are calmed at Jesus' command. Who is this then that the wind and the seas obey him, they ask. And so in God's poetic response to Job, we might hear God saying to us, creation is good, wonderfully made. But within this beautiful world, there is still uncertainty. There is life and death. There is illness and healing. There is destruction and creation. And evil still exists. Its presence is never really explained to us. In response to the questions God asked Job, we discover The answer is that some things remain a mystery, and the story of creation and human life are much bigger than we are. These struggles that we experience are not not the whole of the story. Barbara Brown Taylor writes, Job's question was about justice, and God's answer is about omnipotence. And as far as I know, that is the only answer human beings have ever gotten about why things happen the way that they do. God only knows, and none of us is God. And so some things are unknowable. Some questions don't have answers or won't get answered in a way that will satisfy us. Writer G.K. Chesterton says that the riddles of God are more satisfying than the solutions of man, and yet... We still want solutions. There is real tragedy and suffering and evil in the world. We have seen it for ourselves. 
And so where is the gospel? Where is the good news for us in, in God's words out of the whirlwind and the disciples' experience on a treacherous sea? Where is the good news? Old Testament professor Dan Simidson writes that it is the relationship of trust with God that is more important than answers to our questions of why Job's deeper need was to know that God had not abandoned him, that God still cared for him. What sufferers need, Simonson writes, is a visit from God, is a visit from God. It is to know that God is not asleep in the storm, that God is powerful enough to contain the chaos of our lives, powerful enough to speak peace to our anxious hearts. We may not see answerings, answers for suffering. We may not see answers for suffering. But we do see Jesus on the cross suffering for us and with us. So for Job, a man with real pain demanding a real response, God shows up. For the disciples, Jesus wakes up to face the storm with them. And Job, Job exclaims at the end of it all, now my eyes have seen you. God answers, that is the miracle. The chaos is still there, but so is God. And that is enough. Amen. Having now heard God's word read and proclaimed, let us join together in affirming our faith. We're using a portion of a declaration of faith. God sustains the goodness of creation. God called all he had made good. We declare that the universe of matter, energy, and life is God's good creation in all its parts. Even though evil has emerged within God's creation, we may work and play in it and explore it with wonder and joy. Evil is whatever works against the loving purpose of God for human beings and all creation. Natural forces may have evil effects. Sinful human choices produce evil results. Evil may become institutionalized in our social structures. The power of evil to hurt and destroy, to cut off the possibilities of full human life, calls into question the power and goodness of God. Whether we understand evil personally or impersonally, we cannot explain how it originated in a world made good. But we can affirm that evil is God's enemy as well as ours. In Christ, God shared our agony over evil and broke the back of its power by bearing the worst it could do. God's, God works continually to overcome evil. In the end, it will be utterly defeated. Therefore, we have courage to endure evil, to learn from it, and to combat it.
Let us offer our prayers of thanksgiving for the many blessings we have received in our intercessions for the needs of our neighbors here and around the world. Let us pray. Creator God, we pray for those continuing to struggle with the impact of COVID-19 in their lives. Give your healing touch to the families of the 600,000 individuals lost to this disease in our country and renew your promise of restoration to wholeness for all those who are ill. Father God, on this Sunday, we honor fathers and give thanks for these ordinary saints that have shown us big is not better, that have taught us big doesn't fare well till it is small again and able to honor you and stick with you in spite of obstacles and opposition. Great God over us all, we celebrate our new national holiday, Juneteenth. As we reach for justice for all, teach us that all children are of your love whether we're black or red or white or yellow. Encourage us to live together loving one another and let us be a reconciling force in that direction. Almighty God, we pray for those who share the governing of the world especially for the meeting between Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin. Though we are scattered in different places, speak with different words, and descend from different races, give them a common concern that curbs their national appetite for greed, war, and lust for power in favor of hospitality. And God of life, this pandemic has been the unmaking for many of us. It has left us powerless in the face of life's frugalities and limitations. We are fearful, lonely, and disappointed. But in its wake, it has given us an opportunity to dwell in your very heart. Guide us now in reimagining how we can be a better community of healing and belonging as we begin again. And now with the confidence in the presence of Christ's Spirit among us, let us join in the prayer our Lord taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, go now in safety, for you cannot go where God is not. Go now in love, for love alone endures. Go now with purpose, and God will honor your dedication. Go now in peace, for it is the gift of God to those whose hearts and minds are in Christ Jesus. Amen.